That was nice. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Good on Labor Day Day weekend. Good to see you this morning. I do want to say uh, if you are a guest here today for the first time or back for the first time in a bit, we just want to say welcome home and welcome back. It's good to see you. My name's Pat. Uh, I'm the pastor here, and uh, we're grateful you joined us on Labor Day weekend. Come on, somebody. We're off on Monday. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Oh, no. Somebody's got to work down here. I, blessings and to you. Yeah. So uh, good to have you here. Um, I want to do this today. Um, just this week as I was uh, preparing and, and getting ready for today, uh, God kind of just led me a little bit of a different direction. So if it's okay with you guys, uh, I'd like to change things up just a little bit. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm glad you're okay with it, which is wonderful. Uh, so if you would, go ahead, go ahead and have a seat right where you are. Our team's going to stay, and musicians are just going to kind of chill on the stage a little bit. And now today, normally I do the recap of where we are uh, right before I come back up uh, after the music is over. Today I want to just choose to do that before uh, we do our last two songs, just because uh, I think you'll get it once we get there. But uh, today we're heading into week 33 of our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Acts. Today we're going to be in Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 1 through 15. Yeah, here come some people in. They're like, oh no, he's starting his message. So uh, it's good. But we're going to do things a little different. Um, so we've just come off of chapter 16 in the book of Acts, uh, where Paul begins his second missionary journey. And this journey is going to take, uh, they estimate, anywhere from six to nine months. Uh, and this journey that Paul takes, it's kind of an unexpected route that he goes on. He wants to go uh, towards Asia, but the Spirit of God prevents him from going and preaching the gospel there. It's actually the craziest thing that the Spirit of God would prevent someone from preaching the gospel to a people. But he does. And Paul finds himself going, not to his first or second option, but finds himself traveling to an unknown third option, which actually lands him. Uh, on a continent that had never received the gospel before, the continent of Europe, right? And so Paul goes to Macedonia, and oddly enough, the first town he visits in Macedonia is a town called Philippi. Paul would soon write a letter to those people. Can you guess what it's called? Yeah, look at you scholars, Philippians. Um, and, uh, and here's what's wild uh, about what God does leading Paul to Macedonia, to this new continent to share the gospel. The first convert on this continent to receive the gospel, the first convert is a woman. And I went in great detail two weeks ago about why that is so significant. Do you remember what this woman's name is? Rosabidia. Lydia, yes, very good, right? Lydia is saved. It's a big deal. And then they go to her house. And you guys, the first worship service in the history of that continent takes place in the home of Lydia, a woman. Right? And her house becomes the center of ministry in Philippi. And then if you remember from last week in the scripture we covered, uh, after that uh, uh, amazing thing happens uh, with Lydia, Paul and Silas are going to pray. And some crazy things happen, and in typical Paul fashion, uh, people get upset with Paul, right? That's kind of a broken record with Paul. People get upset with him everywhere he goes. A mob forms, the Jews don't like what he's saying, and they, they form a mob against him, and ultimately... They arrest Paul and Silas, and they put them in prison. Not only do they arrest them and put them in prison, they are actually stripped naked, beaten, and thrown in prison. And if you remember in the darkest hour, around what time? You remember? Around midnight, while they're in prison, arrested unjustly, they aren't sulking in their prison cell. What are they doing? They're singing and they're in their prison cell. And as they're singing, a miracle occurs, right? A miracle that is sparked through praise. Praise instigates the miracle. There's an earthquake. And the jail cell of not just Paul and Silas are open because of their praise. Because of their praise, the jail cell of everyone in the prison is open. And they have an opportunity for freedom. And the one who put them in jail, the jailer, even he, after this happens, is saved, he and his whole household. How does this miracle occur? Well, if you remember, at the darkest hour in a difficult spot, when things were unfair and it was something they didn't ask for, what do they choose to do in that moment? They choose to praise. They offer their praise to God. And church, I just, I, gosh, I was really compelled this week to remind you of this. Never underestimate the power of your praise. 
Never. Never underestimate the power of your praise. I know this is true. Personally, this is, some of you know this story. In 2005, 2004 and 2005, uh, I lost my parents within six months of each other. Um, I was just so upset when my dad died, but when my mom passed away, uh, it broke me. And I was really angry. And you can ask my sisters, I was a mama's boy, right? I believe my mom loved me the most. Anybody believe your mom loves you the most? Listen, I have proof, church, all right? <laughs> when my mom left inheritance, uh, it wasn't much, but she left it to me and my sisters. My sisters always gave her a hard time about me being the baby boy uh, and the only boy. I was an unexpected surprise, right? And so they teased her all the time about loving me the most. And when my mom left us a little bit of inheritance money, uh, she left my sisters uh, $10,000, one of them, $10,000 to the other one. We opened our checks together. I opened mine. Mine was $10,000 and one penny more, which was hysterical. She loved me more. We, we, we laughed hard. Uh, we laughed hard about that. Um, and uh, my mom had some health issues. And uh, when she, uh, she was sick, but she had gotten better. And I remember it was around 2005. Uh, my wife was actually seven months pregnant at the time. Uh, we were so excited. I watched my mom be so good with my sister's kids, and I was so excited for her uh, to spoil my daughter as well. And uh, it took my wife and I six years uh, to have a child. Uh, we had some fertility issues, and we went down that road for six years. If you have to walk that road, we see you and love you, and if you need help with that and want to talk with someone, please come to me or to my wife, and we would love to walk with you. That's a hard road to walk. Uh, we walked that road for six years. Conceived a child, was so excited. And then seven months in, two months away, my mom passes away. I was on staff at a church serving the Lord. I was in a church service, actually. And I got a phone call from my sister that my mom had passed away. And... Uh, some of you know this, but I was mad. I was angry. And I said some things to God and about God that to this day I'm still, I still feel shame for, quite honestly. That's just how I felt in the moment. And I wanted to see my mom one more time, even though she was gone. And we went to get in our car, and we had a really old Ford Focus, and I cranked it up like it would rattle the fillings out of your teeth. It was so old, right? And so started and get ready to go. And I'm mad. I'm angry. I'm silent. I've gone inward. I won't talk to anybody, much less I do not want to hear from God. And this voice, I say voice, this thought came into my mind. I know it was the voice of God because it was the exact opposite of the way I was feeling. Right? Oftentimes when God speaks, it's usually something wild and it's the opposite of what we expect. This is what the voice said to me in my mind. Worship me. I pulled a Peter and I said, no, not doing it. Again, the voice came, worship me. I said, I don't want to. And then just again, the voice, worship me, worship me. I didn't want to, but I wanted the voice to stop. <laughs> and so our car was old. I put a cassette tape in. Some of you might know what that is. I put a cassette tape in, and music began to play. It was a worship tape. And a song began to play. And just in my mind, you know how you know a song that comes on the radio, the lyrics just start rolling through your head. They start rolling through my head. And then... I start kind of mouthing them a little bit half-heartedly with my mouth and then I gave voice didn't want to wasn't my best but I gave voice to the words and I've never experienced it since but when I gave voice to the words that were playing in my car I felt it was the most tangible, palatable presence of God I have ever felt in my life. I experienced peace beyond understanding. And I've not experienced it to that depth since. But it was, I believe, it was through praise. 
a moment I did not want to give, but I gave. And here's what I kind of discovered, right? Never underestimate the power of your praise, but then also the times when you want to praise God the least, probably the time you need to praise Him the most, when you don't feel like it, and things are going wrong, and you're angry with Him. It's when you need to praise Him the most. It centered me, and so I, I just want to speak before we get our day off to the normal routine, Sunday, how you doing kind of thing. I wanted to speak on why we do what we do. Why do we sing songs together? It's not just to kill time so we fill an hour. Church, there is something special and powerful when the people of God join their voices together and praise God. It's important. It's critical. Science tells us this. Something clicks different in our brains when we sing, when we give voice to words, right? Singing by yourself, science tells us, promotes feelings of trust and bonding while eliminating feelings of anxiety, depression, and it reduces stress. You ever wonder why you want to listen to sad music when you feel sad? Even singing a sad song when you feel sad lifts you. It's the power of singing. The London Singing Institute, I found it this week, this is a study they conducted. Listen to this. They said singing alone is powerful, but group singing, group singing can build a sense of community and has even proven to synchronize the heartbeats of those who are singing together. Think about that. It bonds and unites people who sing the same song. They say getting out there and meeting like-minded people and immersing yourself into the joy of singing together alleviates feelings of loneliness and depression. Working together to create a beautiful harmony will build trust among you and your peers while increasing your confidence. Church, if that happens naturally, imagine what could happen when we bring Jesus into the mix and we introduce him and the church begins to sing and faith begins to stir and things are awakened that have been dormant for a long time. Church, this is why we need to praise God. And it's why we need to do it together. Never miss an opportunity. And I think for good church people like you and me, we need to stop taking for granted the opportunities we have to praise God together. It's powerful. Never miss an opportunity to praise. And I know why sometimes people don't. Believe it or not, they tell me. They voice their displeasure of why they don't want to be in here when we sing songs. It's too loud. I don't like the style. I don't like the singer. With all the love I have in my little body, it's not about you. It's about lifting praise to him. And according to Paul and Silas, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, your praise might be the key to someone else's freedom. If anything, it's worth it to bear through a little loudness, to sing for the freedom of a person who's broken next to you. Never underestimate the power of your praise. And so today, here's what I want to say. If you're in a prison, you're held captive to some things that you can't break out of. Or maybe you bought a ticket, and today you're sitting on the struggle bus, and life is difficult, and it's unfair. Or maybe you're sitting in grief. I'm going to tell you something. It's been 18 years since that moment I talked about a little bit ago. Grief knows no time. If you find yourself in grief, Here's what I want to encourage us to do today, to praise Him. Praise Him, just to sing today. And if things are going okay, don't sing for you. Sing for somebody else. For those who are captive, church, let's sing louder. And let's lift our voice and give voice to the one who is greater than anything. Amen. I want to invite you today to stand back to your feet. If you're hurting and broken and you're struggling and you find yourself in grief, I want to invite you to sing. With a voice of faith, with a voice of hope, 
but with your voice today, sing and give praise to God because you just never know when that door is going to open and you might be opening it for someone else. So praise, pray for people that you know, sing for people that you know are broken and wounded today. And let's lift our voice together as one people to our good God this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's sing today. That was good, wasn't it? It was good. Thanks to our team for letting me uh, disrupt things a little bit, do a little things differently today. Um, uh, man, what a powerful time already. So Paul and Silas uh, are set free. Uh, praise. God works that miracle as they praise him. And then here's the wildest thing. I don't know if you think about this uh, uh, as you read scripture, just about how these things like really occurred. And so imagine that miracle happens. They're set free. They go back to the home, scripture tells us. They go back to the home of Lydia and all the believers are gathered. Could you imagine the testimony service that took place, right, in their home as they shared what happened? Could you imagine what the praise must have been like amongst the believers as they shared that story. Like that's what occurred uh, after Paul and Silas were set free. And so Paul and Silas and the team, they meet with the believers there in Philippi. And once they meet there, they leave town and they go on to the next thing. And the next thing is actually where we're going today in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. Remember, Paul is on a missionary journey going from place to place to place. Uh, presenting the gospel, visiting synagogues, and, and talking with people there. Acts 17, verse 1, we're going to spend a lot of time just in probably three to five verses today, uh, and I'll just trust you can read the rest of them on your own. Uh, does that sound good today? Uh, right, we'll, we'll focus on a few, and very challenging scripture today. And by challenging, I mean not hard to understand, but hard to live out sometimes. So very challenging for us who follow Jesus uh, when we read what we're going to read today. I think you're going to see. Acts 17, verse 1. This is Paul and Silas, then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. So let me give you the lay of the land really quick. They're traveling from Philippi to Thessalonica, right? And so they estimate this is a three-ish day journey, 90 to 100 miles to get from Philippi down to Thessalonica. Now Thessalonica should sound familiar to us a little bit who have been around church. Paul would write two letters to some people that live in this town. Do you, can you guess what it's called? Yeah, First and Second Thessalonians. He actually, uh, at the end of verse 15 in our text that we're reading today, he would write both of these letters about two to three months after leaving uh, Thessalonica. So if you want to go home today and get extra gold stars in heaven, go home, read First and Second Thessalonians. It's pretty short. I think you'll have a better understanding of what's going on uh, when Paul leaves this town and some of the events, the big one that we're going to focus on uh, today. Now, Thessalonica was a large city. It boasted over 200,000 people. Uh, it was the capital of Macedonia. So it was the center of government in that area. This was an important city. It was a prominent city. A lot, a lot of important people there. And so this would be a place that naturally Paul would want to stay for quite a while uh, and teach and preach and talk about who Jesus is. And so our, our scripture tells us that at least for three Sabbaths, Paul spent in the synagogues at least three Sabbaths. So we know he was there minimum three weeks. I believe probably a lot longer as he was with uh, the believers there uh, as well. And so Paul was there for uh, quite a little bit. And so they land in Thessalonica, and immediately Paul gets right to work. Now, if you think about what happens to Paul in most places and synagogues that he visits, uh, as we learned a few weeks ago about the type of personality that Paul has, Paul just kind of rubs people the wrong way, doesn't he? Right? People get upset with Paul when he comes in and he presents the gospel. Right? And things happen to Paul that really don't happen to Peter or to James or to Barnabas or to Timothy or to Luke. Right? They aren't beaten and, and stripped and threatened with death quite to the degree that Paul is. There's just something about Paul in the way that he presents things right, that grates the nerves of the Jews that don't believe in Jesus. It grates their nerves to the point that in every city and synagogue he visits, ultimately, what do they want to do to the Apostle Paul? Yeah, they want to kill him, right? This is his life, and this is what he does everywhere that he goes. Now, keep this in mind. Paul has just been beaten, stripped naked, embarrassed, and thrown in prison 
for doing a good work in Philippi, right? And what is the first thing that Paul does when he gets to Thessalonica? Think about it. He doesn't go on vacation. He doesn't take a sabbatical. He travels southwest 100 miles to do it all over again, knowing that the same fate awaits him every single time. Paul continues to do the work over and over, knowing it's going to cost him. And so I thought of a question as I was reading the text this week. Why in the world would Paul subject himself over and over and over to so much difficulty and so much adversity? Why in the world would he just walk into what he knows is going to be persecution that is going to hurt and be very costly? Why would Paul subject himself to this over and over and over again? And I've come to two conclusions. This is why Paul would do it. Number one, Jesus is worth it. And then number two, people matter. Church, Jesus is worth it and people matter. If we could put that on a t-shirt and on the walls and let that drive everything that we do in life, how many of you think this place would be a little better? Right? Jesus is worth it. People matter. Even if it was hard and it was unfair to Paul, Paul still served Jesus and loved people, even when they obviously did not love him back. For Paul, listen to this, it was never about convenience. It was always about commitment. For American Christians, we need to hear this. Christianity is not about convenience. It is about commitment. Not a lot of amens there. Christianity is not about convenience. It's about commitment. We've kind of flipped that around in the American church. Give me my kolache. Give me my donut. My coffee better be right. The pastor better say the right things. If not, I'm taking my ball and going home. Right? We value convenience over commitment. But true Christianity, church, is actually the opposite. Christianity is not about convenience, it's about commitment. Let me ask you this question. Is it convenient and easy to love people the way that Jesus loves us? It is not. It's about commitment. Listen, we don't get to take a sabbatical from being Christ-like just because someone is a turd to us. I know, I said turd, I'm sorry. Sometimes just people be like that, right? <laughs> they just do. We don't get to take a break from being Christ-like because someone's a turd to us. We should not let it be our goal to turn around and be a turd right back to them. Because Christ has called us to something better. And he's called us to something higher. And he's called us to something more life-giving. Please hear this today. Jesus never commanded us to get even. He commanded us to love the way that he does. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. I'll start in verse 38. Jesus says, you've heard the law that says the punishment much must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If your suit in court and your shirt, shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Wouldn't that just be a lot easier? <laughs> it would be so much easier to do. You've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but Jesus says I say love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even the corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. That kind of Christianity is not convenient, is it? That kind of Christianity takes commitment. What I just read from Jesus, here's what I think. I think that's the kind of Christianity that's going to change people. That's the kind of Christianity that's going to make an impact. That's the kind of Christianity that is attractive to people. In church, that's the kind of Christianity we are called to. We are called to a faith that requires commitment. And we need to be committed. We need to be committed. Let me tell you why. People are hurting. People are broken. 
I had one of those weeks last week where I talked to a lot of people up here. And I'm going to tell you something. People are hurting. And they are broken. And they need Jesus. People need Jesus. And they don't need some knockoff generic brand that people show him. They need Jesus. They need him. Not some generic brand. They need the real thing. Let me ask this question. And after I ask it, you're going to wonder, what does this have to do with people needing Jesus? Just follow me here. How many of you love cereal? Raise your hand. You love cereal. Like you would eat it for dinner. And serve it for dinner thinking you're a great cook. Anybody out there? Love cereal like that? Yeah, I respect it. I respect it. There's me. Everybody loves cereal. On the count of three, I just want you to shout out your favorite cereal, all right? I know I'm going to hear some weird ones and make fun of them, but it's okay. Stand strong, all right? On the count of three, you say your favorite cereal. One, two, three. Dude, the people of God have spoken. I heard only Cinnamon Toast Crunch. That's insane. Um, All right. I respect what just happened. The Lord is amongst us. I have two favorites when it comes to cereal. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. How many Cinnamon Toast Crunchers? All right, quite a bit. But my absolute favorite cereal are Fruity Pebbles. Okay, I heard someone. Whoever said ooh, there's a different church somewhere for you, so I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm teasing. We love you teenagers over there. I like Fruity Pebbles. And listen, go ahead and start judging me because... I pour the, the peb, Fruity Pebbles in, I pour the milk in, I let them sit on the counter for five minutes and let it get soggy. Yep, the milk turns a good color. Mm, it's the best. It's the best. Mwah, it's chef's kiss. I let it. Listen, here's the deal. When I eat cereal and in my household, oh, hey, my wife just walked in. Hey, baby. i um, about to tell a story about her in a minute. Isn't that funny? When I eat cereal, and in our home, we buy generic everything, all right? How many of you buy generic? Great value is just a good value. I'm with you, right? I I love that. I buy generic everything, but early in our life, I told Alice, we'll buy generic everything, but there's two things we splurge on in the worship home, Pop-Tarts and cereal, all right? All right, no shame if you buy generic that. That's fine for you. But for my family, we'll eat generic everything so that we can eat brand name cereal and brand name Pop-Tarts. Don't come at me with generic cinnamon crunch with that little fox on the box because, listen, that, that joker right there will rub the roof of your mouth raw, all right? And you know it, right? I think they put razors in there or something with the cinnamon because it just messes your mouth absolutely up, right? When Alice and I first year got married, we almost didn't make it out of our first year of marriage because I had told her we're going to go cheap on everything except Fruity Pebbles and whatever you like. Uh, I said, don't buy Dino Bites. Don't come at me with that. I know they're $2.29 for a 40-pound bag. I don't care. I'm going to pay $5 for a tiny box, and you're going to love it, all right? Said, don't buy the fruity Dino Bites. I can tell the difference. And so in our home, we had, especially when we first got married, uh, before we got lazy, we had these clear Tupperware cereal containers. Anybody have these out there, right? You use them for a while, but then how many of you just say, it's easier to just put the box in there, right? It just is. So Alice thought she would pull a fast one on me, and she thought she would try out my, my palate, so to speak. She cooked up a nice good bowl of cereal for me, brought it to me, handed it to me. She sat down on the couch next to me, and I was wondering why she was just staring at me. And I take a bite, and as soon as I take a bite... With all the pettiness that I could, I dropped the spoon so it made the loudest noise on the bowl that it possibly could. And I said, this is Fruity Dino Bites, isn't it? And she lost it and started laughing. And we lost it and started laughing. And we decided in that moment, we're not buying generic cereal. It's just better for our marriage. That's why we do it. Church, listen, I go all that way to say, there ain't nothing like the real thing. The real thing is just better. Here's what I think. Church people need Jesus. They don't need some generic knockoff brand Jesus where his people don't take his commands seriously. They don't need that. They need the Jesus that loves unconditionally. And here's why it matters. Do you know where they're going to see that Jesus? 
Do you know where they're going to learn what Jesus is like and who he is? They're going to learn it from us. And if we aren't committed and following Jesus, we're going to give them some janky version of Jesus that they're going to reject. But if we are committed and we show them who Jesus is and how radically he loves and how self-giving and co-suffering he really is, people need that. They're going to listen. Commitment over convenience. The early church changed the world because they were simply committed and showed Jesus to the people. Right? Listen, if we're not compelled to truly follow Jesus, why in the world would anybody else be compelled? Christianity isn't about convenience, it's about commitment. I mean, listen to verse 6 of Acts 17. Listen to what people that don't believe what Paul is selling. Listen what he says about Paul and the Christians in that area. Acts 17, verse 6. They're wanting to drag Paul and Silas out, and in typical Paul fashion, they want to kill him. Okay? Listen to what happens. And when they could not find them, Paul and Silas, because they hit him, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, and listen what they shouted about them. They intended this to be a cut down. But listen what they say. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And listen what they say. And they are acting, they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. That's supposed to be a cut down to Christians. These Jesus followers are turning the world upside down. And it seems as if they love Jesus more than Caesar sick burn, right? You've turned the world upside down and it appears your allegiance only is with Jesus. I say yes to that. This is the biggest compliment you could pay a Jesus follower. They are turning the world upside down and they only have one king, Jesus. And they really weren't turning the world upside down. I think they were turning it right side up for the first time. And people were beginning to notice that power and money and class and position and empire and playing all the political games, that wasn't the top priority for the Christians. They weren't interested in power or leverage. They were only interested in making it on earth as it is in heaven. And people bought in left and right because they were committed. The kingdom was advancing, and even people who disagreed noticed that the kingdom was advancing. They noticed Jesus and the followers of Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves this question. Do people notice Jesus in you? Do they notice him in me? More than just how good we, we are when we come to church or where we go to church. When you're in your office or in your workplace or in your classroom or in your home or at Walmart or on the ball field. Or most importantly, watching your child on the ball field. Do people notice Jesus in you? Would they be able to say of you, this person is turning the world upside down. And it appears they give their allegiance to Jesus above everything else. Can that be said of us? Do people notice Christ in us? Is Jesus really king over your life? Do we really honor him? And church, do we really know him? Like, really know him? As a follower of Jesus, how many of you think we ought to know Jesus? And we ought to know about Jesus. But I'm about to make a statement that you may not like. And I hated writing it. But I think for the average American Southern Christian, this is especially true. Talking about knowing Jesus, listen. We've probably done more research and study, and we have more information on the Hunter Biden laptop story than we do about the scriptures that contain the story about Jesus, who we confess as Lord. We know more about Fox and CNN than we do scripture. Most of us could probably give a detailed rundown of presidential candidates then we could take someone to Scripture and show them who Jesus is. Because we don't know. Christianity is not about convenience. It is about commitment. Is Jesus really king over your life? Does he have supremacy over everything else? 
And church, if not, today is the day where his people need to repent. Amen? We need to turn back to him. We need to immerse ourselves into the one that we claim is our Lord. They turned the world upside down because they lived their confession that Jesus is Lord. And this is what we are actually empowered to do. If you remember the theme verse from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, right? But you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that you can be my what? Witnesses, witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And so the goal for the church, the people of God, is to be a witness wherever our feet are. If we're going to bear witness about Jesus, shouldn't we know about him? Yes, the goal is to bear witness wherever our feet are. And if we're going to be like Jesus, then we've got to live like Jesus. And we have to love like Jesus. First John, listen to this. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, praise God, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but does not obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. But those who obey God's words, word truly show how completely they love him. This is how we know we are living in him. Listen to verse 6. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as who? As Jesus did. Those who live in God should live as Jesus did. Living in obedience is how we know if Jesus is Lord in our lives. It's how we know. That is a convicting statement to me. Living in obedience is how we know if he is Lord or not. Those who say they live in God ought to live as Jesus did. Listen, the measuring stick for being a Christian, it's not what denomination you belong to. I hate to break this to you. It's not what service you attend at FCF, although this is a good one, right? First service, the best service, right? It's not whether or not you only listen to Christian music. It's not whether or not you lift your hands when you sing music or not. Like, that's important, but here's something we tend to forget. The measuring stick for being a Christian is this. It's being like Christ. That's how you know if you're a Christian. Are you Christ-like? Am I Christ-like, right? They turned the world upside down, and all they were armed with was being like Jesus. And it was enough. So much that people who disagreed noticed they turned the world upside down, and Jesus was their king more than Caesar or the empire. This is why Paul after getting beaten and stripped naked and jailed, would travel to the next town and go to the next synagogue and do it all again because Jesus is worth it and because people matter. Jesus is worth it and people matter. We need to live like Jesus. But I also want to say this, and we'll wind down with this thought. We need to live like Jesus, but we need to talk about Jesus. Live like him and talk about Jesus to people. Paul would write this in Romans. Listen to what he says. He says, but how can they call on him, Jesus, to save them unless they believe? And how can they believe if they've never, what, heard about him? And how can they hear unless someone, what, tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Listen, we are to present the good news with our lives and with our lips. Silence is not an option when it comes to sharing the gospel with people. You have to talk. You have to. I know St. Francis of Assisi is credited with a quote, right? Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use what? Words. I'll believe it. We need to use our words all of the time. They're not going to hear unless we what? Tell them, unless we speak. So we've got to use our lives and our lips. This is what Paul did in every town. 
This is scripture we'll, we'll wind down with. Paul and Silas, verse 1, traveled through the towns of Amphipolis, Apollonia, and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths, three weeks in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded to join Paul and Silas along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. We see what Paul does. Paul uses scriptures to reason with people, to explain who Jesus is to people, and he uses scripture to prove to people who Jesus is. This is what Paul did in every town, every synagogue. This was the plan. And so what I want to do, I want to close out by just giving you just three thoughts about sharing the gospel with people, telling people about Jesus. Because eventually, you're going to need to open your mouth and tell people about the one you confess as Lord. Are you with me? And so I just want to give you just a couple of pointers. And then we'll use, use the Apostle Paul kind of as our guide. So let's talk about sharing the gospel. The first thing Paul did was this. He reasoned with people. He reasoned with people. The Greek word is dialegami. Everybody say dialegami. You feel smarter, I feel smarter, right? Dialegami, it's a fun word to say. We get our English word dialogue from this, all right? It means this, like when Paul went into a synagogue, he didn't go in preaching turn or burn, all right? Actually, any time an apostle presents the gospel in the book of Acts, heaven or hell is not even ever mentioned, all right? Jesus alone is enough, right? You don't get to manipulate people, Jesus is good, right? So he goes in and he has a conversation with people. He talks to people. Doesn't preach a sermon, doesn't give him three points. He first dialogues and talks with people. It means this, there were questions and there were answers. They took the time to converse together. Let me give you just this point. This is probably the best one you can walk out of here with today when it comes to sharing Jesus with people. Don't start, don't start with death. Please, don't start with death. Just have a conversation with them. This is what Paul did. Let me say it this way. Conversation works better than condemnation. All right? Have a conversation. Talk. If people matter, talk to them like they matter. Have a conversation. Let them ask questions. And here's the cool thing. You're not going to know every answer. You know what that is? That's just an open door to go back and have the conversation when you find the answer. That's the great thing about a conversation, right? It treats each other with dignity, and it leaves the door open to go back. Paul was excellent at this, and it opened the door and opened people's heart for him to take the next step. And eventually, the next step is this. He explained, the key word is explained, the prophecies concerning Jesus to the people. The Greek word here means that basically he opened the scriptures, right? He opened the Bible. He talked. He knew where to go. He had a little bit of knowledge about who Jesus was in the scriptures, and he didn't have the New Testament yet. He only had the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures. But he had knowledge of where to go, these certain places in Scripture he could go to explain to people who Jesus is and why he had to come to this earth. Now, if we're going to teach people about Jesus, we need to know a little bit about the subject that we're going to teach them. Would you agree that makes sense? We need to have a little bit of knowledge. For people to take us seriously about Jesus, we need to know about him. We need to do a little work. Christianity is not about convenience. It's about commitment. We need to do a little work. We have to know what we believe. How many of you would say that's important? We need to know what we believe, why we believe, and why we need to believe it. If you don't know the answer to that, how in the world could you lead someone else to? Knowledge matters. We need to have a little bit of knowledge. You don't have to have a plethora, a cornucopia, a variety of knowledge. Just a little knowledge. Do some work. Read your scriptures. We have this incredible tool called the World Wide Web. It's awesome. There are all kinds of incredible resources. I've given you several of those many, many times. Right? Paul was effective because when people talked to him, they knew he took it seriously. And if people are going to take us seriously, we need to have a little knowledge about Jesus. Third thing he did was this, conversation, 
explained, taught a little bit. He had knowledge. And the third thing, he invited people to believe, and he invited them to join community every single time, right? He extended an invitation to them. Eventually, we need to invite people to something. We can talk their heads off all that we want, but until we invite them to be a part, right, it's not finished, right? Paul doesn't want them just to be saved, but it's critical that they're part of a community. Paul never goes into a city, shows up, shows off, and ships out. It's not what he does. He always goes into a city, and he plants a church, a group of believers. Why? Because community matters. Paul knows that growth and the gospel is always lived out best in community. We have a family value here at FCF that we are refreshed by what? Relationships. We're refreshed by relationships. You saw all the stuff when you came in today, right? And that was a great transition by me there. You saw all the stuff when you walked in today about life groups. It's how we do community here. What we do on a Sunday is incredible. I love it. Hopefully you love it and you want to come back. It's great. But there's only so much we can know about each other by staring at the back of someone's head for an hour. Eventually, we need to not sit in rows. We need to sit in circles. And we need to get in each other's lives. And we need to talk and share and discuss and grow and study and pray together and laugh together and eat together. All those good, this is where growth happens. This is where Christianity really, really, really is so effective is when we do it together. It's powerful. I'll talk about it at the end of service. Community matters so, so, so much. Paul preaches Christ crucified and resurrected. Same message, every town, every city. He doesn't change it. Why? Because it's enough. And if Christ crucified and resu resurrected was enough for Paul to change the world, how many of you know if we have knowledge of that, it's probably enough for us too. So I just want to challenge you today. Do some work. Be committed. Truly follow Jesus. Learn about him. Get to know him. And I found when, when I do those things, opportunities just begin to pop up for me to be able to share a little more. Christianity is not about convenience. It is about commitment. Last scripture, Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The gospel, the good news about who Jesus is, it is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. We, and so we need to know about the gospel, why Jesus came, who he is. And I want to challenge you and challenge myself. Let's not be lazy followers of Jesus. Let's do the work and let's get committed so that others can know the goodness of God like we know it. Amen? Amen. Can we pray together today?